All right, so uh, welcome back. And this is chapter 12 of the psychology second edition uh, textbook on social psychology. And I will tell you tonight, we're gonna be touching, cause it's social psychology. We're gonna be touching on some, some topics that uh, will be um, uh, maybe some controversial, um, might make some people uncomfortable. I'm gonna show a video a little bit later that I will tell you right off the bat and I will give you a warning again when I show, just before I show the video, that there are some disturbing images um, and that, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to force anyone to watch it, but, you know, one of the things social psychologists try to do is answer questions like, you know, how did, how did the Holocaust happen? What makes good people do bad things, for example? And so we're going to talk about conformity. We're going to talk about the ash effect. Uh, we're going to talk about different, different things like that uh tonight and um and then we'll go from we'll go from there um give me just one second uh, and let's see yeah so here's the first slide and already we are delving into something that's confidential, uh, co uh, not confidential, sorry, wrong word, uh, could be uh, construed as um, controversial, right? So this is a picture from um, a demonstration after Trayvon Martin was shot in Florida. Uh, and then of course, last year we had the, uh, the George Floyd um, murder. And uh, and of course, since then we've 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 had a conviction, and uh, you know th these are some of the questions that that uh, that we try to ask, right? And so in this particular um, for this particular slide, the question asks, you know, was Trayvon Martin's death the result of self de defense, or was it racial bias, right? Um, and it really, right now, it's just a rhetorical question, um, just some food for thought, right? Um, and there may be, we may never be certain of the answer, um, but that is another thing that, that social psychology kind of delves into as well is racism and prejudice and, um, uh, and, and those kinds of, uh, of topics. Let's see. So social psychology um, deals with all kinds of interactions like I was just saying. And, um, you know, they look at moments of confrontation to moments of people working together to moments of people helping each other, right? Um, and they really believe that an individual's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are influenced by social situations. Thoughts, feelings, behaviors, are influenced by social situations, right? So what is the context? What's the environment? What's happening, right? Um, and so there's two different types of topics. There are intrapersonal topics, right? I-N-T-R-A, personal, intrapersonal. And that's what's going on within ourselves, right? Um, our emotions, our attitudes, um, our own um, cogn social cognition, right? It's all about the self. And then there are interpersonal topics um, that, are, that they look at, such as helping behavior, aggression, prejudice, discrimination. Um, and we'll talk about the difference between the two. Um, uh, attraction, close relationships, things like that. This is what social psychology looks at. And then they also look at what is um, influences uh, our behavior, right? So one idea is, is that there's, there's situationism, right? And that's the idea that um, our behavior and actions are determined by our immediate env environment and surroundings. Um, and this is basically what uh, social psychologists use. And then there's dispositionism, 
in which that's the view that our behavior is determined by internal factors. So in other words, they attribute a person uh, to a person such as uh, personality traits, temperament, those kinds of things. And <coughs> dispositionism is used by personality um, psychologists. So social psychologists use situationism. Um, personality psychologists use dispositionism. And dispositionism is also um, favored uh, in the United States. Um, and it's important to point out that uh, modern psycho social psychologists do consider both the situation and the individual um, when looking at, at things. So there's also this idea of fundamental attribution error. And with fundamental attribution error, um, that's the tendency to overemphasize internal factors, right? Um, uh, people tend to fail to recognize when a person's behavior is due to a situation as opposed to, or they wanna blame it on them, right? Um, so, there was a study that was done, right? The quiz master study. I'm sure you guys read about it in the, uh, in the textbook and where participants were randomly assigned um, to either play the role of the questioner or the participants. And what the questioners did was they developed difficult questions to which they knew the answers. Um, and then participants who answered the questions um, only did so correctly 40% of the time, right? So four out of 10 times uh, were they able to answer the questions. And so the participants, as a result of that, tended to disregard the influence of the situation, right? That the questioners actually developed the questions, knew the answers, right? Um, and wrongly concluded that the questioner's knowledge was greater than their own, right? <coughs> and so that would be an example of, fundamental at, um, attribution error. And the other thing with um, fundamental attribution error is that research suggests that people from individualistic cultures, so here we are um, talking about individualistic cultures versus collective is cultures again, right? Um, that individualist cultures have the greatest tendency to commit this error when, when assessing a situation. Um, people from collectivist cultures, such as Asians, right, are more likely, Asian cultures are more likely to emphasize relationships with others than to focus primarily on the individual. So it's kind of like a rehash of, of, of the definitions we talked about in the, in the last chapters. Uh, they focus on a broader perspective that uh, includes both the situation um, and cultural influences um, on what they're observing. So there's a lot of terms on this page. Um, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time with this and we're gonna be, uh, you'll see again, um, it come up throughout the presentation. But the first thing is a self-serving bias, right? And a self-serving bias is the tendency for the individual to, to take credit by making dispositional or internal attributions for positive outcomes. Um, but when it comes to um, negative outcomes, they look at the situation or external uh, attributions. So in other words, if, um, if, if, if something good happens and, and, and I'm involved with it, then I'm gonna take credit by saying, yeah, because I'm a hard worker, um, I'm good at what I do, right? So that, that's my self-serving bias there. I'm, I'm taking credit. And all that might be true. But let's say whatever project I'm working on ends up being a flop, right? Um, I might look at that and go, well, you know what? Um, you know, the advertising department didn't do their job or I didn't get support over here in the research department. And so it was doomed to failure, right? I'm still hardworking, but this isn't my fault, right? It's like that self-serving bias and it protects a person's self-esteem um, and it allows people to feel good about their accomplishments 
while disregarding um, something that maybe didn't go as well because, oh, that's not my fault. So that's a self-serving bias. Um, and then attribution is the belief about the cause of the result. So I attribute um, the success to my personal attributes of conscientiousness, right? Of working hard, um, of being a good guy, right? Um, and then if it's, it's, it's a failure, then I'm going to attribute that failure to advertising or the research department or somebody on the team that didn't do their part. Um, and so the model of attributions follows three uh, dimensions. We're gonna revisit these again. You'll see these shortly. So one is locus of control. Remember, we talked about that in the last chapter. So an internal locus of control, that's a person that, that believes that they have some power that they can exercise over the outcomes. Um, external locus of control. This is a person who believes in luck and chance. And if something happens, um, it was good luck for me. Or if I wasn't able to you know, pass my exam, you know, then, then it was, there's something wrong with the exam or the professor or whatever the case may be, right? So they're, they're looking at things outside themselves. And then the next um, uh, dimension is stability. And that is the extent to which the circumstances are changeable. And you'll see that example here down here in just a second. And then controllability, which is the, to the extent to which the circumstances can be uh, controlled. So the example here you see is when our team wins, right? Uh, we make attributions such as, all right, um, that team, they're, they're talented, right? So that's, that's internal locus of control. Um, they're hardworking, right? So that's, that's exercising, uh, I'm sorry, that's exhibiting the stability, right? Um, and then, uh, and they use effective strategies. So, so in other words, they're smart about what they do. They, they know the good plays to do. Um, and, and that is viewed as being controllable. So you see in that one paragraph, the dimensions of internal, um, the locus of control, the stability, and what's controllable. On the opposite side of that, when the team loses, we might say that the other team has more experienced players, or we might say, hey, they have some ringers, right? Uh, or they cheated, um, or they underinflated their football, whatever the case may be. Um, the other team, uh, played at home, right? So, um, and that's considered unstable because um, the team that lost was not at home. And then the weather affected um, the team's performance. And of course, weather being viewed as uncontrollable. So those are the three, uh, three dimensions of attribution. And then there's also the, the idea of the just world hypothesis. And basically this is people get what they deserve. Um, and this is basically, so it's based on the belief that the world is a fair place and therefore good people experience positive outcomes and bad people experience negative outcomes. Um, I will say that, you know, you see a lot of just world hypothesis, um, or I have, I should say, um, a lot recently, right? Um, so for instance, you know, why can't they just get a job? That's an example of a person taking a just world hypothesis. Uh, they must be doing something wrong, um, you know, uh, et cetera. People who, um, who uh, hold these viewpoints tend to blame others, people, for the situation they're in. So if you're poor, it's your fault. Uh, if you're unemployed, it's your fault. Um, you know, and while at the same time ignoring, you know, uh, for, existence, uh, for, for instance, um, unemployment and, um, and poverty, right? 
ignoring the fact of there, there might be uh, environmental situations happening, um, the circumstances, where they're living, what are the uh, cultural causes of poverty? Um, you know, why do white families have uh, typically and historically more accumulated wealth than uh, black families? And somebody might look at that in the just world hypothesis and say, oh, well, they don't work that hard or whatever. And ignore the fact that, uh, ignore the history of segregation, ignore the history of redlining that prevented um, uh, African Americans from purchasing properties, getting loans, right? Things like that historically, um, because generational wealth is, uh, has been more successful um, with white families typically in the United States. I'm not saying for everyone, um, than for black families as an example. All right, so next we move into uh, self-preservation, right? And uh, I'm sorry, self-presentation and presenting ourselves. And, and this kind of reminds me of uh, in the last chapter on personality, when we talked about persona, right? The mask we wear. So not exactly the same thing, but if you think about it, we, we all look at what are social roles, social norms, what are our, our scripts? And then we're gonna look at uh, Phil uh, Zimbardo's work as well uh, in this section. So social role, that's the pattern of behavior that is expected of a person in a giving setting. So if you recall, remember when we did the, um, the elevator video, right? So when you get on an elevator, what is, what is the expected pattern of behavior on an elevator, right? You get on and everybody kind of looks forward, right? So somebody gets on and they do something the opposite, um, you, you know, it kind of calls attention to that. Um, let's think of some other social roles. For example, you guys are engaged in a social role right now, uh, being a student. Um, when you're at work, you have a particular social role there. Uh, so we, we take on different roles depending on, on um, the situation or depending on the peer group that we're with, right? Uh, so think of it, uh, think of that Venn diagram, um, but think of more circles, right? So uh, you have your student role, you have your job role. If you're a parent, you have your parental role. Um, you know, uh, trying to think of another one to throw out there, a sibling role. Uh, so, so various roles. And then there are social norms and scripts. And social norm is what's the group's expectation of what is appropriate and acceptable for its members. So uh, questions to ask, right? So I'm in a particular group. So how am I supposed to behave? How am I supposed to think? Um, what am I expected to talk about, right? What am I expected to wear? I'll give you an example. So let's just use, uh, uh, let's just pare this down to a small group. So many of you guys know, I work with uh, people who are um, recovering from substance use disorders, right? And we send them to meetings, you know, like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. Um, and there are expectations within that peer group of how a person is supposed to behave, how a person is supposed to act. What are you supposed to talk about, right? Um, that would be an example. So, you know, take a minute and think about some of um, some groups that you might belong to or overall in the culture, in our culture in Southern California, what is acceptable behavior, what's appropriate. And then there's the script. And think of the script as your personal knowledge about uh, what's supposed to be happening in a particular setting, right? So, um, so we all have a role. And we, we all have norms that we have to abide by. And we all have a script. In other words, a part to play. Um, how do you act when you walk into an elevator, right? So that's kind of like the example that I was just using. What, what's the appropriate way to, to, to act in that? Do you face the front, face the back, right? Um, how do you act on the first day of school? How do you act in a restaurant? 
And it's also important to realize that these scripts will um, vary, you know, by culture. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So, all right. So Phil um, Philip Zimbardo, he was a psychologist that uh, and a professor at uh, Stanford University. And he conducted an experiment in 1971. Uh, and I will tell you this, uh, the experiment has some criticisms. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the criticisms was that, that he, he himself as the researcher um, got too involved in it as well. Um, the, the experiment kind of went out of hand, uh, got out of hand. Um, and, uh, you know, there were some, there were some, <laughs> some issues with it. Um, but what it did demonstrate is uh, the power of, um, uh, of, of, of roles, norms, and scripts in certain um, situations, right? So it's, when I started this lecture off tonight and I asked the, the question rhetorically, you know, I, I asked, you know, what, you know, how did the Holocaust happen, right? So we can all agree Nazis are bad, but I'm not sure every single soldier was bad, right? Like what makes a good person do very bad things, right? And, um, uh, and, and so this experiment kind of, uh, kind of tried to answer some of that. Uh, Ashes conformity experiment, which we're gonna see shortly. Uh, Milgram's obedience experiment, which we're gonna see shortly um, really, uh, can kind of go a long way in explaining. It's like, wow, like we'd all like to believe, oh, if I was in that situation, I would never do that. Yes, we'd like to all believe that. It may not be as simple as that. And there is, there is very, there's a lot of power in social roles, social norms, and social scripts. So, so we'll go ahead and watch the first um, video. Uh, and this is kind of the introduction to it. Um, and then we'll go from there. The Stanford Prison Experiment is possibly the most famous psychological experiment of all time. An insane role-playing game gone horribly wrong, thanks to nylon stockings, fire extinguishers, and a sadist nicknamed John Wayne. So what really happened behind those prison walls? Here's a look at the untold truth of the Stanford Prison Experiment. The experiment begins. With funding from the U.S. Office of Naval Research, Dr. Philip Zimbardo began the Stanford Prison Experiment in August 1971 to study the effects of prison life and examine the power dynamic between inmates and guards. As he later wrote in his book, The Lucifer Effect, Zimbardo wanted to know, if you put good people in a bad place, do the people triumph or does the place corrupt them? He began by putting an ad in the paper for volunteers who would be paid $15 a day to participate, about 93 bucks in today's cash after inflation. After selecting 24 guinea pigs, Zimbardo and his assistants converted the basement of Stanford's psychology department building into a makeshift prison, then flipped a coin to decide which test subjects would be guards and which would be prisoners. It would turn out to be a fateful decision. Welcome to prison. The experiment began when real-life cops pretended to arrest the students playing prisoners. They were hauled to the actual Palo Alto Police Department, booked, fingerprinted, and then blindfolded and tossed in a holding cell. Once they were transferred to the fake prison, things got a lot worse. The prisoners were ordered to strip naked, douse with a spray, forced to wear dress-like garments without underwear, and nylon stockings as hats, and fit with a chain locked around one ankle. The students playing guards were also encouraged to make up their own rules, leading to 17 strict guidelines the prisoners were forced to live by. Prisoners were only allowed to refer to themselves by number, and guards would randomly wake them up in the middle of the night with screeching whistles and force them to exercise. Zimbardo even got into the act himself, playing the prison superintendent, where he always sided with the guards and encouraged them to create a sense of fear among the inmates. But the prisoners soon began fighting back. The Prisoners Rebel 
On the second day, the prisoners went on strike, removing their hats and the numbers from their uniform and blocking the cell doors with their cots to keep the guards from entering. That's when things got even darker. The guards on duty called for reinforcements and used a fire extinguisher to force the inmates away from the door. After forcing their way in, they removed the cots, forcing inmates to sleep on the floor and refused to let the prisoners eat or brush their teeth. They also threw the ringleaders of the insurrection into solitary confinement and forced others to clean toilets with their bare hands while spreading rumors that some inmates were informing on the others in the hopes of getting preferential treatment. Finally, the guards stopped letting the prisoners use the toilets at all, forcing them to do their business in buckets, which they weren't allowed to empty, turning the whole fake prison into a giant open sewer. Prisoner number 8612 loses his mind. Less than 36 hours into the experiment, Douglas Corpy, a.k.a. prisoner number 8612, apparently lost his mind from the stress. One of the ringleaders during the rebellion, Corpy had been thrown into solitary confinement and was a target of harassment from the guards. According to Zimbardo, Corpy began screaming and crying, although the doctor and his staff initially thought he was just faking it in an attempt to escape. Eventually, they let him out, fearing for his mental health. Corpy later claimed he faked it all, telling SF Gate, the breakdown I had was a manipulation to get out of that damn experiment. But in a documentary made by Zimbardo, Corpy told a different story. It was an experience of being out of control, both of the situation and of my feelings. Meet John Wayne. One guard in particular was noted for his sadistic tendencies. His real name was Dave Eshelman, but the prisoners called him John Wayne, though in fact he consciously modeled himself after the villainous prison warden from the Paul Newman movie Cool Hand Luke, going so far as to use a southern accent when speaking to the prisoners. Eshelman orchestrated all sorts of terrible hazing, forcing the prisoners to play leapfrog so their gowns would ride up and expose their privates. He once ordered two prisoners to act as Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein, forcing them to embrace while saying, I love you. As his final infamous act, Eshelman and forced several of the prisoners to simulate intercourse. Tellingly, the other guards didn't stop his actions. I started to get so profane that, uh, and still people didn't say anything. According to Eshelman, though, he's not really sadistic at all, but actually a good guy who was simply trying to expose the evils inherent in a prison-type environment. He told Stanford Magazine, I set out with a definite plan in mind to try to force the action, force something to happen, so that the researchers would have something to work with. From Eshelman's perspective, any blame lies with Zimbardo. Nobody was telling me I shouldn't be doing this. The professor is the authority here. You know, he's the prison warden. He's not stopping me. Things fall apart. Over the course of less than one week, five students playing prisoners had to be released due to severe psychological issues caused by the abuse of their guards. Perhaps the worst was the case of prisoner number 819, who broke down weeping. When Zimbardo allowed him to rest in a nearby room, however, the prison guards lined up all the other inmates outside the door and forced them to chant, prisoner number 819 did a bad thing, over and over again, until the poor guy was reduced to a blubbering wreck. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. He was eventually replaced by a new guinea pig, prisoner number 416, who was so horrified by what he saw in the prison, he immediately staged a hunger strike in protest. Guards responded by tossing him into solitary confinement. The experiment had gone off the rails, and the only man who could stop it had lost all perspective. As Zimbardo put it himself, I had become the superintendent of the Stanford County Jail. That was who I was. I'm not the researcher at all. Luckily, someone with perspective showed up on day five. Zimbardo's then-girlfriend, Christina Maslek, was an assistant professor at Berkeley. After showing up to help with the experiment, she was appalled to see the prisoners chained together with paper bags over their heads. She confronted him that night. We had a long argument. At the end of it, he then decided, this is it, I've got to shut down the prison. And so then the next day, everything stopped. The experiment was supposed to run for two weeks. It had only lasted six days. Aftermath. Shortly after the experiment ended, the horrific uprising in Attica prison took place, thrusting Zimbardo and his research into the spotlight. Researchers are still arguing about what it all means. Zimbardo himself has said it goes to show how normal people can be turned evil by circumstance, telling the BBC, the study is the classic demonstration of the power of situations and systems to overwhelm good intentions of participants and transform ordinary, normal young men into sadistic guards. Others aren't so sure. 
As some critics think Zimbardo unintentionally skewed his results with his methods, which may have attracted participants who are much more aggressive and less empathetic than the general populace. Plus, Zimbardo wasn't just a scientific observer. He actively participated and even encouraged violence and brutality, corrupting his data in the process. Tellingly, when psychologists conducted a similar experiment in 2001, they remained observers, and the guards never got anywhere near as aggressive as John Wayne and his cohorts did at Stanford. The significance of the Stanford prison experiment came into question again in 2004, when a group of American soldiers tortured and humiliated Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib prison. Zimbardo was called to testify as an expert on behalf of one of the defendants, who claimed the system encouraged the guards to act violently. Zimbardo agreed, saying Abu Ghraib was the Stanford prison study on steroids. The defendant still received eight years behind bars, however, which some might consider an ironically fitting epilogue to the saga of the Stanford prison experiment. Thanks for watching. Click the grunge icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too. The Stanford Prison. The St <clears throat> all right, so so that's the uh, Stanford Prison Experiment, and the next video. Uh, this is the one that um, uh, will have some. Um, disturbing video, uh, disturbing images. Um, there will be uh, uh, some nudity. Um, I'm actually gonna stop the recording um, so that I, it won't be on the, um, um, it won't be on YouTube. So I'm gonna stop the recording, but I just kind of wanna give everybody the opportunity. You're not required to watch this. If you find this disturbing, please uh, take care of yourself. Um, and, uh, but it is, uh, I, I play the video after talking about the Stanford prison experiment, um, because it's interesting that you see some of the same situations, um, even though there's a lot of criticism with Zimbardi and his, um, uh, or Zimbardo and his, uh, experiment, including he wasn't exactly the um, observer, the independent observer. Um, he was more involved. Uh, there, there definitely does seem to be some connection, some correlation that, um, that situationally uh, people can be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That good people can do bad things, right? So, so I'm going to pause the recording here, um, and then I'm going to play the video. Uh, the other reason why I'm pausing the video is because it's age restricted and um, you know things like that. So um, the other thing that I find interesting is in, in the Stanford prison experiment, one of the things that the guards did, um, which they actually do here in Abu Ghraib as well, or Abu Ghraib, um, very similar bags over the heads, uh, simulated sexual acts, um, you know, basically designed to humiliate or dehumanize the individual. So you take two males and you force them to engage in, in um, sexual activity, you know, that's designed to, um, to uh, emasculate them in some way. At least that, that's how I would view that. Uh, and, the, and the same thing happened with, um, you know, in, in Iraq. So uh, the sad part is, and again, this is why I say why, what makes good people do bad things? You know, we, this isn't, um, uh, well, I'm not doing this for, you know, to say anything against, you know, people who serve in the military or anything like that, right? Um, so the video itself though, uh, does have a little bit, I will admit, has a little bit of a political slant that is not why I'm showing it. I'm, I'm basically showing it for, you know, what are the images that you see and what is actually what happened there. So, all right, so I'm gonna pause the recording and play the video and then we'll come back together. All right, we're back after having the, the um, discussion on the uh, Stanford prison experiment and the um, Abu Ghraib video. Uh, and now we're moving into the next section, which is attitudes and persuasion. Uh, and the first thing we're gonna talk about is the idea of cognitive 
um, dis well, first we're going to talk about attitude and then move into cognitive dissonance. You know, so attitude is basically our evaluation, you know, of a person, an idea, an object. Um, uh, and it can be positive, it can be negative, um, and it's influenced by internal and external forces, um, uh, factors, I should say, that we actually control, right? Um, we, we do have control over our attitude. So there are affective components, there are three, three components. One is affective component, which is feelings. That's how I am, that's my emotional response, right? How I'm feeling in the moment. Then there's a behavioral component, and that's the effect of that particular attitude on our behavior. So if I have a positive attitude towards something, I may be, behave more positively. Um, if my attitude is negative, um, that may also be reflected in, in my attitude. I mean, in my behavior, I should say. And then finally, there's the cognitive component, which is what is my belief uh, and, and what is my knowledge about the situation or, or whatever it is that I am assessing in that moment. Um, so yeah, so overall, you know, whenever we have an attitude on so something, um, it really is an assessment or an evaluation. We're looking around and we're constantly doing that. And then um, the next thing, and that's where I started to go because um, I got confused on my slides, but uh, is cognitive dissonance. And cognitive is dissonance is, is that discomfort that a person will feel for having two or more inconsistent attitudes, behaviors, or, or thoughts, um, or belief systems, right? So for instance, the example I'm gonna use here, and, and, and you'll see it in the next slide as well, is that believing that cigarettes are bad for your health, but smoking cigarettes anyway. Um, and then that can cause cognitive dissonance, right? As an example. And so what people do in order to reduce their cognitive dissonance, remember cognitive dissonance is gonna be a feeling of being uncomfortable. So, they can change their behavior. So I'm experiencing this. I know it's not good for me. Um, I need to stop smoking, right? And so they might change their behavior and actually quit smoking. Or they might use a couple of Sigmund Freud's defense mechanisms, right? They might be change their belief by rationalizing, by using rationalization or by, or by using denial, right? such as discounting the evidence that smoking is harmful, right? So <laughs> I'll give you an example. I have a friend of mine, uh, he's been smoking for years. Um, sometimes he'll tease me and he'll just say, I love smoking, right? And, uh, and then he will actually, when, if I've ever had like this conversation with him on a serious note, he will actually engage in disputing the evidence or disputing secondhand smoke um, research, things like that. He'll just dispute it. And so that's the way he's using it in order to kind of um, uh, ease his cognitive dissonance or his rationalization. And God, I hope he never hears this video, but he won't, yeah, he won't. <laughs> anyway, um, then there's another thing that a person can do and they can just add a new cognition, a new thought. And something like smoking suppresses my appetite so I don't become overweight, which is good for my health. So yes, I'm doing this. It's not exactly good for my health, but the other impact of it is, is that I won't get fat and, and uh, that is good for my health, right? So then later research found that only conflicting cognitions is those things that threaten positive self in uh, image uh, that caused dissonance, right? So, um, you know, going back to that Venn diagram as an example, uh, and imagine having two conflicting thoughts in that Venn diagram that I displayed earlier regarding, you know, the real self or the ideal self, input two other conflicting thoughts that threaten your positive self image. Like, I express lots of, lots of empathy, but I just yelled at my neighbor, 
right? Um, and treated them very bad. Um, so you got these two, two things going on um, and that's going to be a threat to your, to your, uh, to your positive self image. And that's what's going to cause dissonance. Um, can also cause uh, psychological, I mean, I'm sorry, physiological arousal and activate um, brain areas involved in your emotional response. Remember the amygdala, the limbic system, right? Um, and, and your cognitive functioning as well. So, so what I want you to remember about this is cognitive dissonance is psychological discomfort from holding two competing cognitions, right? So here's, the, um, here's a chart, right? So smoking is bad for your health um, and I am a smoker, right? And so the, the, the cognitive dissonance occurs um, and so in the diagram here, in order to remove that tension, you go one of two ways, right? So smoking is bad for your health, I quit smoking. Or the research is inconclusive, and as a result of that, you just remain a smoker. Um, and then any other information that comes in, you'll probably uh, discount it um, in order to alleviate your cognitive dissonance. And then there's also the initiation effect. And what's interesting about the initiation effect is um, there, they did an experiment in um, 1959 and where they recruited college students and they put them in three different conditions for like this group that was going to regularly discuss the psychology of sex, right? Uh, which I'm sure attracted a lot of uh, college students. I'm sure that's what they wanted to do. Um, and they put them in three conditions, right? There's no initiation. You just show up, you're in the group. No initiation at all. The next group had easy initiation. So you had to jump through a hoop, um, but it wasn't that bad, right? Uh, and then you were in the group. And then the third group was difficult uh, initiation. So you had to jump through a series of hoops. You had to do some things. You had to meet some criteria. And um, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the research study, what they found was, now all three groups were the same, as far as that goes. They talked about the psychology of sex. They did you know, lots of you know, the same things, right? Um, the students found, um, or the research found that the students that were involved in the difficult initiation condition liked the group more than the students that were in the other conditions. Um, and this was um, attributed to the justification of effort, right? So the, the harder the effort, uh, the more likely they were going to say that they liked it. Uh, now, whether or not that was true or not, it, you have to take it at face value. They probably did. So imagine you go through a lot of effort to do something, you're invested. If something is just handed to you, maybe you're not as invested. So that was the effect of initiation. That was the experiment uh, that found that, which is, which is kind of interesting, part of the persuasion. So then persuasion itself is the process of changing our attitudes towards something based on some kind of communication, right? So um, here you have a picture of a car with all kinds of bumper stickers. That's probably the most uh, uh, common form of persuasion that we see, right? Uh, also television commercials is a form of persuasion, things like that. So we encounter these attempts everywhere we go. Um, it's formal advertising, it's informal, um, and there are several routes that we're going to talk about. And um, so here's a couple of the paths. So the first path is known as the central route of persuasion. And in the central route, this tends to be logic driven. Um, it uses data, data and facts. And it's a direct route of persuasion that is focusing on the quality of the information. 
um, and works best when the audience is analytical and willing to engage in the processing of the information. And you'll recall at the beginning of the semester, one of the things that I talked about was um, that I hope at the end of all of this, that, that you take away the importance of critical thinking, right? Not criticism or not just automatically dis discounting stuff, but actually critical thinking, right? What does the data say? What are the facts? Where do the facts come from, right? Um, what is the quality of the information? So if, if I'm talking about critical thinking, I'm actually talking about a group of people that um, is going to use that analysis um, and, and, and the central route will work with those individuals. So if I know if I have a, a group of analytical people um, that I'm gonna to present to, that I'm gonna to try to convince them of something, I better come with the facts. I better come with the peer reviewed data. Um, I better have the research that backs it up um, or the studies or the statistics, right? That's the central route. The peripheral route is indirect and it uses cues to associate positivity with a message, right? Um, they use characteristics such as positive emotion. Um, this is where you get your celebrity endorsements, um, you know, your influencers, right? That, that, uh, that will market a product. Um, <coughs> the thing about the peripheral route um, in general is that the attitude change about a certain thing tends to be less permanent, um, whereas the uh, central route uh, is a little bit more permanent. And so here's a graphical diagram of that. So the persuasive message here on the left, and you have two different uh, routes that you're gonna take, right? So if your audience is motivated, it's analytical, um, and they engage in high effort processing, they're gonna evaluate that message, right? It's kind of like what I was talking about before. Um, and this type of persuasion actually results in a lasting change in attitude. Whereas the peripheral route, the audience is not as motivated, right? Um, they're not analytical. Uh, they're processing, they're gonna use low effort. They're, um, and they're gonna be persuaded by cues outside of the message, emotion being one of them, right? Um, which is why sometimes some of the political messages are done the way they're done. They're actually kind of using, um, in, in some cases, not always, um, uh, emotional cues and cues outside what the actual context of the message is. Um, and this will result in a temporary change of um, attitude. And if you're doing politics, it might get you that vote, for example. Then there's the uh, foot in the door technique. Um, this is a very common phrase. I'm sure you all have heard it over the years, right? And this is where the persuader, I, let's, let's say it's me, and I get you to agree to do me a small favor. <laughs> Once I get you to be able to do that small favor, um, I've got you. I'm, I'm, my foot is in the door. It makes it easier for me to come back and make a larger request. And because you and I have worked together before, it's going to make it easier for you to, um, uh, to say yes to my request, right? So, uh, so the example here, okay, so we have a um, couple pictures here, right? I get you to wear a button and um, then the next thing you know, I, I'm able to have you plaster stuff all over your house as an example. Just a little. <laughs> yeah, just a little. All right. So those are, uh, so that's the persuasion techniques. Any, uh, any comments on that or questions, I should say. I'm kind of looking at the time, I'm getting close to nine. Uh, let's see, because this is where I thought we would end up. And I'm thinking, let's see, thinking we can wrap this up on Monday for this part. There's a couple videos that I want you to watch um, with this. And uh, 
I want to make sure that I don't break it up because this part and then the next section um, uh, have a lot of material. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to end this here um, and we will pick up on Monday evening since it's close to the end of class um, and finish up uh, chapter 12 on Monday evening and then move into chapter 13. Um, so, all right, so I'm going to uh, end the recording and we'll do part two on Monday.